second edition of uh, In The Room uh, 2021. Um, today I'm joined by Brian Cameron of Dodge & Cox. Welcome, Brian. Uh, thank you, Steve, and great to be here with you and your audience. Yeah, uh, good, good. Um, my name's uh, Steve Backhouse, and I'm the host of the In The Room webinar series, um, and we always look forward, forward to these conversations. Um, before I get into the house rules, I mean, what you, what you, won't, what you might realize is Brian, is coming to us all the way from California. Um, so I think, so that we are this morning, it's we're 8.30 on Tuesday, the 20th of, of April. Brian is still on Monday, the 19th of April. Uh, and it's uh, 11.30 uh, PM. So Brian, we really do appreciate uh, you staying up late and, and, and chatting to us today. Um, You're very welcome. I'm gonna tell all my friends that the audience was so captured, they listened to me for two days. That's gonna be my story. <laughs> There you go. Uh, quickly, before we get get going, a couple of couple of house rules, uh, as always. Um, so these webinars, we try and make them as interactive as possible. Um, so please, um, will the audience please post your questions via the Q and A Q and A tab. Um, what we'll do is I'll chat to Brian for 20, 25 minutes or so on a, on a on a on a on a couple of things. I mean, Brian's been in the industry for I think 30, 38 years or so. So we're really going to get, get to understand his career, um, but the lessons he's learned about Dodge and Cox, um, the markets and how he sees the world. Um, and then we're uh, uh, yeah, at about uh, kind of 20, what, kind of a, close to, to nine o'clock or so our time, uh, we'll open the floor to, to questions, but please post them uh, as, as, as and when we go. Um, and then we'll, I'll pose those questions to Brian. Um, and we'll carry on with that. And then and if the questions run out, then Brian and I'll carry on chatting uh, and the webinar will end at 9, 9.30 sharp. Um, CPD points, it's always the all important CPD points. Um, uh, you will receive a thank you mailer uh, after the webinar uh, with, the, with the CPD points. Um, if you have been able to attend kind of 90, 95% of the webinar, the CPD points are allocated automatically. Uh, if not, there is a short assessment uh, that, that, that you will need to, need, need to, to do to get your CPD point. Um, yeah, otherwise, I think that's it from, from the house rules. Yeah, that's all. Okay, cool. So then, otherwise, Brian, Brian and I can, can get cracking. Um, so yeah, Brian, I think, first of all, I think a lot of the, the audience would definitely have heard of, of Dodger Cox as kind of our investment and in market has kind of gone more global. And you've had investment managers from around the world come into our market and we get to know them. Um, but it might be worthwhile giving, giving the audience a sense of who Dodge and Cox is or, or are um, and, and, yeah, and, 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 and kind of where, where you've come from. We'd be happy to do that, Steve. And uh, again, thank you to the audience for your participation um, uh, today. So Dodge and Cox is an investment management firm, which has been in business about 90 years now. We're independently owned by uh, about 70 of the individuals that work at our firm. Uh, we've always been independent. Our primary office is in San Francisco, California, with about 300, a little bit over 300 employees based there. And we have a second office in London with six outstanding employees whose primary um, uh, job is to service our overseas outside the United States clients through our use its vehicles. Our assets under management approximate $340 billion. About $190 billion of that is equity uh, investments around the world and approximately $150 billion of that is fixed income investments, mostly in the United States. On the equity side, we have a group of about 35 professionals that are doing all the research and making the decisions on the portfolio. We operate really just three portfolios, uh, one concentrated with investments in the United States. We call that the Dodge and Cox Stock Fund and some related portfolios. One invested primarily in companies outside the United States. That's the Dodge and Cox International Portfolio, which is not available in a usage form. 
And then the third portfolio is the Dodge and Cox Global Fund, which um, both the stock fund and the global fund are available on a use its uh, basis. The keys to our investment philosophy really are three, very research intensive. We pride ourselves on knowing as much about any investment we make as anybody in the investment community in the world. Uh, second, a long-term time horizon, which we define as three to five years. And then finally, we lean strongly towards the value style of investing. So I'll stop there. Um, certainly open to any questions towards the end on anything more about the foundational parts of our firm, but I think that's a good start. Yeah. And I mean, I do want to also chat to you about kind of the, at some point, the, 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 the trend of kind of value versus growth and where we are in, in the cycle um, with value and growth. But again, we'll, we'll chat about that a bit later. Um, now you've, you've, as I said earlier, you've been in, in, the, in the investment game for, I think it's 38 years. Um, how long, and of those 38 years, how long have you been at, at Dodge & Cox? Well, all 38 years. So that's the easiest question I'll answer tonight. <laughs> yeah. But it's actually very typical of our people. Most, most of our people start and end their career with our firm. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's, so, I mean, so and then actually, and you, I know you're retiring, I think, at the end of the year. So you're coming to the end of your, end of your, end of your career. Um, but one thing, again, we had a, a, a lady called Vicky Rivers, who, who runs uh, Morningstar Investment Management uh, in, in SA. And she came to talk, talk to myself and my colleagues about a year or so ago. And one of the key characteristic, characteristics when she spoke about Dodge and Cox was, was your retention of, of, of staff. Um, and, it's, and, and, and your retention rate is, and it's saying ridiculous, like you almost have had one or two people um, leave the firm to a competitor in the last 30 years. Is, is, that, is that right? Well, that might be overstating it by one or two. I, I don't remember any in the 38 years I've been at the firm, um, but there may have been one that I've forgotten about. But the, the point of the question, the answer would be extremely low, very rare for any of our people to leave for any reason, whether it's to uh, competing firm or to do something else in a professional sense. So again, most of our people uh, begin in, in their professional career with our firm. If you're wondering why that is, or you yeah. noted kindly that it's uh, unusual, I, I think it starts with trying to find a good fit at the interview process towards the beginning of one's career. And certainly we know what we're looking for. And, and if we're doing our job well, we've identified a select group of people that would be uh, consistent with what we're looking for, great analytic ability, great communication skills, and a good fit with who we think we are as a firm. Certainly not perfect, but collegial, professional, and ethical and whatnot. Um, but once you're there, I think you find it's a great opportunity. If you're intellectually curious, if you have analytical ability, it's very challenging business, but it offers a great opportunity to try to find good long-term investments for our clients. I think we have a differentiated style, very long-term oriented, but again, with a strong lean towards value. We have very good colleagues, so it's an enjoyable place to work. It's a successful firm. Um, and you have opportunities for additional uh, responsibilities during the course of your career. My own career has all been on equity research and decision-making, but certainly this director of research role, which I've had the back half of my career, was certainly very enjoyable and additive. And... Uh, you can own part of the firm, which is somewhat unusual these days. And finally, we operate in a team framework. And I think that's important because there will be things that go wrong with your portfolio or individual stocks. But we take the position of uh, we're either all heroes or we're all goats. It's not, you know, one individual. Uh, you're, you're to blame for this. And why don't you go find something else to do? That, that's not how we operate. And uh so it's more of a collective enterprise, and I think that served us well over time. But I wouldn't represent us necessarily the perfect or only way to run a successful firm, but it's worked well for us. But it's got to be, it's, 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 I mean, it's very interesting. It's got to talk to a very, very strong, strong culture, um, which, yeah, which I mean, that's yeah, amazing. Um, okay, cool. Then let's, I think let's get into the kind of the, the chunky part of the conversation, and that's kind of your, your views of you or your views in the, in, in the world. Um, so first of all, I actually listened to a podcast, uh, Dodge and Cox podcast, I think yesterday, um, and a couple of key themes came through. One was just to start with. One is kind of your your kind of your post post COVID, the opportunity for growth post COVID, um, and so I'm worried my dog is going to start barking because my 
Well, I just got back from a, from a run, so there we go. Um, so hold on a second. Sorry, excuse me. Um, uh, and um, it's one of the things that, that what I saw is that, so obviously in SA, we've noticed, um, and you've seen the global kind of news, like big tech's done really, really well over the last, last little while. Um, but in the podcast, your colleague spoke about kind of back to kind of the fundamentals of, of, of businesses with strong balance sheets, and particularly kind of in the financial sector. What's your, your view on the, on, on, on the banks and, and the financial sector? Right. Well, um, you know, based on what you heard on that podcast, there's a number of uh, big themes that I think Dana and Charles uh, were trying to address. And certainly the COVID uh, really impacted this market um, and in some ways accentuated what was already happening in the market, a very strong period for growth investors from at least early 2017 through um, fall of 2020. And of course, the last six months, that's all reversed. But I think it, once COVID hit, which was an exogenous event that surprised us anyway, and probably most in the investment community, you know, I think the terms opportunity or growth or uh, some great investments as far as we were concerned and some of the downtrodden areas were all things we've been talking about consistently over the last year. So your focus of your question came down to the financial area, which has frankly been quite controversial. This was a group that was uh, had its issues prior to COVID and got more issues for, for COVID. Specifically, the macroeconomic environment deteriorated for banks, certainly in the United States and in Europe and the UK, uh, to some extent in emerging markets as well, depending on the economic conditions. But uh, specifically interest rates, which are already low and even lower post-COVID, and then the credit quality issue, which really was not a huge part of the equation or the problem, became one with the forecast that perhaps many individual small businesses, perhaps even some large businesses would be uh, severely impacted in terms of their ability on the credit side. So the banks and financial institutions had nothing but problems post-COVID, but that resulted in even lower valuation for many we often see virtue in not only low valuation, but some sort of an investment thesis that would lead us to believe within a three to five year time frame there would be significant improvement. In the case of financials, we didn't think it was necessarily even going to take three to five years. Uh, we thought the, the uh, cure would be the opposite of what the disease was, specifically the healthcare science would ultimately solve COVID healthcare solutions would lead to a strong economic recovery, perhaps even higher interest rates. And in retrospect, this all started six months ago, uh, November 9th, to be specific with Pfizer followed by Moderna's vaccine. So uh, what you've now seen the last uh, six months is finance uh, uh, being one of the stronger areas of the market, not the strongest energy actually was also very downtrodden and became the strongest sector in the S&P 500 over the last six months. But finance has been right there uh, with energy in terms of victims of COVID the first nine months of 2020 and now uh, 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 leading, the, leading the markets around the world as um, healthcare solutions are, have come and are coming and uh, followed by a full healthcare recovery. And in the case of the banks, uh, interest rates have started to rise. So in the United States, they began this year at 0.9% interest rate and that's all the way up to 1.65 at the end of the first quarter. So there was a sudden and significant rise in interest rates. So the macros have turned for the banks and, and for many, particularly in the United States, we also like the individual fundamentals of strong franchise, great balance sheets, uh, ability to raise dividends and repurchase shares, which got a little bit derailed by regulatory policy during COVID. But I think there's greater flexibility to do that now. So I'll stop there because we could spend the whole hour talking about finance and things. Uh, it's, so you mentioned energy. I mean, so again, that's again, that's so maybe can you delve a bit into the energy energy sector? I think also it might be worthwhile. You took, you know, you kind of got you got uh, Biden and the Democrats appear to be a bit more more on the green side of of um, of, of their policy making versus what the, what the Republicans were, which is always at a view that that could have a, a negative impact to energy. But obviously, there's a bit of a tailwind for energy or post kind of what they came out of from the, from the COVID environment. 
Uh, yeah, great question. And we have been significantly overweight in energy for a period of time. And um, going back to when the Saudis uh, pulled the plug on energy prices and feeling that the competitive um, situation coming out of U.S. shale was not to their liking over the longer term. So that caused quite a dip in energy prices. My recollection from about $100 a barrel to about $27 a barrel. It had rebounded to 65 to 70 prior to COVID. Uh, energy stocks were sort of a roller coaster consistent with uh, energy prices going up and down during that period. But then COVID uh, uh, really threw the industry into a, a, a total free fall. So 100 million barrels a day of demand uh, pre-COVID for oil fell to about 70 million barrels a day pretty quickly with the economic lockdown. Industry clearly wasn't built for that. Oil prices fell to about $20 a barrel at the bottom. Um, and then subsequently rose to about $40 a barrel by year end and then to $60 to $70 a barrel again post-vaccines. Post, uh, so there's been some help on the political side, but a lot of this is tied to the state of global economy. Um, and so our thesis really longer term in, in the valuations have followed COVID and the price of oil, but our, our thesis is really that there would be some increase in demand over time driven largely by emerging markets, not so much uh, the United States and Europe, but emerging markets is where incremental demand was coming for oil. And on the supply side, there's been a severe underinvestment in the business over the last five to six years due to low prices generally, and this eventually will have supply consequences. So that's the core of our thesis. But in the short term, COVID sort of created a whole nother opportunity, which was the recovery coming from the economic uh, situation. Uh, you referenced the green and, uh, you know, isn't uh, energy dead, isn't oil dead. You hear comments like that. And there's certainly a foundation for those comments because uh, some combination of public policy pushing alternative fuels and, frankly, consumer preferences for alternative vehicles, et cetera, to use less energy or, or no oil at all, in case of electric vehicles, um, certainly is part of the scene. So what is interesting, or once you dive into the data of that 100 million barrels a day, approximately 30% of that is due to passenger vehicles around the world, cars and passenger trucks. Most people think that's much higher than 30%. But that 30% will be impacted by the push towards uh, electric vehicles. And you name the Biden administration and other public policy officials that would like to push that trend. And frankly, I don't know how much it needs pushing because many consumers are heading in that direction. But today, only about 5% of the new sales are alternative vehicles, alternative energy vehicles. Uh, so the other 95% are more conventional internal combustion engine vehicles. So those will, every sale today, 95% of the sales will be on the road for another 15 years or so. And so this will change very slowly over time. We've done a lot of research on the topic, and we think within a decade, perhaps about a quarter of the auto sales will be um, EV. And the impact of that plus better miles per gallon or better efficiency in the in the vehicle fleet, all that together might lead to a decline of about 3 million barrels a day. So that number sort of surprises people. Now that's significant, but could easily be offset by continued growth of the other 70 million barrels a day, if you're following the logic, leading to still some incremental demand for oil over that 100 million barrels a day over the course of the next decade. So I've thrown out a lot of information there, but um, oil is far from a growth industry, but we would also argue it's far from a fall off a cliff industry or a uh, doing a fast fade, uh, it, it'll probably reach a stabilized level of demand within the next decade or perhaps slightly longer, and then maybe a slow fade after that. But of course, technological change beyond EV type vehicles could also change that demand curve, and we monitor all that closely. Uh, it, so I've also got two, two questions that come out of this topic. So one is, what is it? Is, and maybe a short answer, because I don't want to forget the second question, which I think is probably more important, is how flexible are these energy companies? So again, you, you look at if they, and how innovative are they? Because again, it's, as you say, as you spoke a lot about oil, but if they are kind of innovative and flexible, then they potentially can look at kind of diversifying their revenue streams. Um, or are they kind of real old kind of 
giants that are, which would get you say, will kind of stumble along um, for the next couple of or a couple of decades, and but not to become irrelevant, but keep doing what they're doing. I think it's very difficult for any company the size of the major integrated oil companies to really change their stripes um, because they're just so big that any incremental yeah. investment or startup sort of a situation or, you know, investments in alternative fuels, you know, could look like a large number, but in relation to their size, unlikely to be meaningful. So I think if they were really going to change their own composition of their business, they'd probably have to do extensive merger and acquisitions into related energy businesses or otherwise to really do that. Some may choose to do that over time, uh, recognizing where the future is going, but I think many of them will remain predominantly integrated oil companies, to be frank. They get a lot of pressure to do otherwise, and some are giving a lot of verbiage to being something other than large integrated oil companies, but I think they'll, for the most part, remain mostly that. Yeah, they're, they're a bit like the Titanic. It's quite difficult to, 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 to or the, what's it, the, the ever, ever given, trying to get up the Suez, Suez Canal. Um, you, they must you, must you said it more succinctly than I, so we're going with the <laughs> Titanic analogy. That's a good one. <laughs> um, and then my second question actually talks about ESG. So in SA, we probably had a look behind the curve on ESG investing um, from, compared to the rest, rest of the world. But it is becoming quite a bit of a, a kind of a, a hot topic here now. Um, how do you, I mean, how do you, again, you talk about energy companies, oil companies, they, they're often seen as kind of the, wor the worst, the worst of the kind of the environmental bunch. Um, how are they coping with, with the kind of, and how do you look at them from an, an ESG perspective? Well, there's several aspects to your question. And uh, certainly no matter, uh, you know, to companies in the private sector, to public policymakers, to consumers, to investors, there's all an increasing interest in ESG. And some of that spills into our world and lands at the doorstep of the investment manager. Certainly, there are some investors that are ESG specific, socially responsible investment community, which I define as they either exclude certain companies or industries from consideration due to perceived bad metrics around ESG, or they favor certain industries or companies around favorable metrics. To be clear, we and most investment managers are not that way. We, um, we have a broad universe of a diverse group of companies by industry and frankly by ESG metrics, but that doesn't mean I or we don't care about ESG type variables. We do extensive research around all variables that might impact a company's long-term outlook, including all the ESG variables. Uh, we have a template that we have all of our analysts fill out, which screens for all this information. And what we're really looking for, any ESG variable that might rise to the level of a significant opportunity or risk over our time frame of three to five years. And if it does, then it's included with the other key opportunities and risk in comparison to the valuation. So certainly it's one of many things that we look at and consider in an investment, but it wouldn't be the determining or overriding uh, factor. So that's the investment world. Having said that, I think companies themselves are getting so much pressure from either the public policy side or from their own uh, potential customer or existing or potential customers or perhaps even certain shareholders uh, to do a lot around ESG. And, and so I think to the extent people want to change something in our world, um, you know, the, the mechanism to do it through either public policy means and or uh, direct dialogue with the companies is perhaps as effective as anything I can think of as opposed to trying to do it through ownership of companies. That's history would suggest that uh, that, that might, might do something in some cases, but might also not have, have more limited impact, I would think. Oh, cool. Um, so actually, the questions are coming through quite thick and fast, which is always really nice. So I'm going to start, I'm going to actually get, get to some of those. Um, so we've spoken in the kind of the last 20 minutes or so, we've spoken a bit about interest rates and inflation. Um, and the first, the first question is from Nadim, um, and, is, and, and I'm going to read it out. Uh, what is your view on inflation and the spike in bond yields that we have seen recently? 
Yeah, great question. And it's really at the core of what's been moving markets. I think when you look at why growth uh, was so successful from at least 2017, 2020, certainly part of that reason was declining interest rates. And I could go into the framework and theory behind that. Um, but conversely, I think, uh, you know, interest rate direction moving up would likely favor certain groups. I've mentioned finance is one that would be favored by rising interest rates. Technology and high growth stocks probably would be disfavored by um, a rising interest rate environment, um, which we can go into more if there's interest in the correlation there. But in a more conventional uh, look at why interest rates go up and down, um, certainly the, the sudden and significant increase that I mentioned again, it's uh, interest rate, the 10 year treasury in the United States has risen about 1% over the last six months from 0.6 to again 0.9 by year end to uh, about 1.6% today, 1.65 at the end of the quarter to be technically correct. So, why did this happen? It clearly was healthcare recovery leading to a perception of a full economic recovery ahead. Uh, uh, followed by fears of inflation, which is certainly part of the question. And uh, the Federal Reserve uh, Chairman in the United States, Jay Powell, has said he believes that inflation will exceed 2% uh, in the not too distant future. So uh, a lot of people are expecting that to happen. The huge stimulus packages that had happened prior to President Biden's election and certainly the $1.9 trillion stimulus recently voted on the U.S. and similar packages around the world to us might be throwing gasoline on the fire. So relative to expectations, which are still fairly modest or people viewing inflation as temporary, and you see that by interest rates while they're up, they still are nowhere near the level of current or, or possible inflation going forward, not just in the United States, but around the world. So you see sort of a, a really uh, lack of fear around inflation in the fixed income world. You see it in the stock market again, equity or, or technology stocks are still extremely highly valued in this market. They really have not yet taken a hit due to rising interest rates or other reasons. You see a little bit of that, but not a lot. So you see by valuations in the market, the uh, people are still fairly sanguine about rising levels of inflation. We would be probably more concerned. Um, again, a really hot economy seems to be what's gonna come out of the COVID era combined with a lot of stimulus. Uh, and eventually, uh, Federal Reserve response uh, could all lead to significantly higher interest rates. It wouldn't surprise us uh, by 2022 if the tenure in the U.S. was 3% or greater. That's not a single point forecast. It's just a scenario, a possibility. But that would not surprise us at all. It would surprise the markets and it would surprise a lot of investors. But for us, I think we've been towards hot economy and uh higher interest rates, higher inflation, higher interest rates as a consequence of all that. Do you, you, do you see some inflation inflation risks um, come in, in the near future? I mean, that's, that's how I hear it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah. there's a foundation for it. You see, you know, clear evidence of it currently. Again, the Federal Reserve and other people are saying, oh, don't worry, it's only temporary. We, we wouldn't be quite so sanguine about that. Yeah, yeah, okay, right, cool. Um, okay, next question is from Andrew. Um, this is quite an interesting one. Andrew talks about the, I think, the world we and what sort of work does Dodge and Cox do to model an, in unexpected impacts like COVID uh, that no one thinks of? Um, I, your thesis for, the, for, for those outliers and out of, the, and out of interest, what are, the, are these theses for those outliers? So again, it's kind of, how do you, I guess the way I read it is, how do you model for these really unexpected events? I mean, is it possible to model for these, these types of things? Yeah, I'm glad you're sort of modifying the question because uh, almost by definition, the low likelihood exogenous once in a hundred years, whatever you want to call something like COVID uh, is very, very difficult to uh, model or um, uh, really build your portfolio around and and why because we would deem and most people would deem them fairly low likelihood I mean even the case of COVID okay it seems obvious now it became a pandemic but there are at least five to ten sort of similar scares 
in my lifetime around different diseases and yet none of those did rise to the level of pandemic. So even when you see a problem, it's very difficult to forecast that that necessarily is going to be a, a, you know, a meaningful and, uh, and, and real sort of risk to things. I think what you do in a portfolio sense is you want a lot of diversification in your portfolio around company, number of companies, number of industries, number of sectors, number of geographies, so that whatever the exogenous event is, it's not going to, it would be unlikely or highly unusual to take everything down. So even in this pandemic, you know, parts of our and most portfolios ended up having a temporary hit, but recovered fairly quickly in the technology areas, healthcare, media, uh, consumer staples. There were areas of this market that actually people figured out pretty quickly were not disadvantaged by COVID or even in some cases advantaged by a stay from home environment. So, um, you know, on the other hand, finance, energy, industrials, travel, leisure, all were severely pounded by COVID. So if your whole portfolio was in certain industry or certain sector of the economy, then maybe you did run an unusual risk. So long story short, I think it's diversification principles protect you somewhat from almost any type of uh, exogenous event. You know, it's a different exogenous event 12 years ago with the financial crisis. That one was centered in the financial industry and home mortgages and whatnot. So you don't quite know where they're coming from. You hope if they happen, you're somehow got lucky and got out of the way or reacted quickly. Or something. But long story, that's hard, hard to do. And, and, um, you want a diversified portfolio and you want staying power in, in, in all your companies. It's, it's problematic if you have a whole portfolio with bad balance sheets or cash flow dynamics, because then your timeline might not be so good if you are hit by an unforeseen problem. It, it actually also talks to me. We had a, I've had a couple of chats with different SM managers and one of the things that came across a couple of the guys was also it's, it's an increase. These, a lot of these trends were actually on their way anyway. So I use the, the prop, the property sector. Now the work from home flexibility, the WeWorks, those that those environments that it kind of your your ch- that those are happening anyway, and COVID just just actually just increased the pace of those those trends. Um, and I think uh, you spoke about that earlier in terms of kind of some of the, the other kind of fundamentals, your, in, your energy and, and, and kind of and, and your banks, and, and again talks to you, know, you got you got strong strong businesses with good balance sheets. They're going to withstand these things, um, and a lot of our. I mean, I look again. I look at a kind of our market. Yes, it took a took a t- took a dip, you know, a big dip, kind of in what March, April last year. But it's you know it, it's it's recovered quite nicely since then. Um, so a couple, couple more questions. So this is a this is a different one. Um, actually, go back up and find it um, from Lee. Um, is having an MBA degree still a pre qualification for all investment professionals at Dodge and Cox? If so, what about an MBA uh, is so important for a skill set perspective? Yeah, yeah, I think it varies from investment firm to investment firm. But for us, we find great value in that in graduate degree, specifically the MBA. In part, it's what you learn in a postgraduate sense. Uh, people come from all different undergraduate backgrounds, some liberal arts, some from STEM orientations. Very few actually come with undergraduate business degrees. So some of the disciplines around finance, accounting, strategy, et cetera, are useful in a formal education sense. Frankly, I think um, my experience counseling a lot of young people in their 20s on the value of an MBA, and it's not for everybody, but I think uh, you enter into a graduate program such as an MBA at one level in terms of your confidence, your knowledge, your familiarity with uh, businesses and commerce and private sector enterprise in general. And you leave two years later with a different level of understanding and confidence. You just see the maturity uh, grow during those two years. You might not even realize it's happening, but I think a two-year immersion in by being surrounded by other business students, faculty, outside speakers, uh, internships, et cetera, all leads to significant personal growth. So by the time they in, join our firm, um, you know, we, we, we and they have a pretty good uh, understanding about um, whether this is a good long-term fit for employment and back to one of our original parts of the discussion. In our case, we've been fortunate to 
find a lot of really good fits over time. And I think part of that is the educational experience, which we require, but it's not required of all investment firms or all financial services firms. And I wouldn't suggest we have the only formula that works along those lines. Um, so one question I actually do want to ask you earlier, um, and I missed it, is, and again, you kind of, you mentioned it is in your time. So again, you guys have said you've been around 38 years, Dodger Cox, the investment industry. I mean, what are, what are some of the key lessons you've learned over those 38 years, which, which would be quite interesting for the audience, audience to hear? Right. Well, um, I guess I, uh, like most investors, uh, you know, have some bumps and bruises along the way. So there are some lessons learned. Um, you know, I think the best investors know an awful lot about the investments they make and operate with a tested and solid framework. Ours is long-term outlook versus valuation. There are other philosophies or frameworks that also have been proven to work. So again, I don't represent that to be the only one, but you need to be consistent and sort of the framework by which you're looking at investments, not sort of a blow at the wind and have a different philosophy every time the market turns or something. So um, know a lot and be consistent in your framework would be two foundational principles or things that having experienced this for 30 years, I would reinforce. And, and you hear versions of that in people that write books and have become famous in investing. But in spite of all that, uh, sometimes investments work out as planned and sometimes they don't. And so I think the characteristics that I value most are patience, perseverance, humility, uh, and even keeled uh, personality. So you're not sort of going up and down with your investments all the time that you can keep your feet on the ground, uh, so to speak. And finally, I think, you know, you don't really know what the business is all about until you have clients. And so this, one one real key learning is we are here to serve our clients and we are very fortunate that they have entrusted us with their savings and their resources and expect us to do a good job with that over time to meet their long-term goals and needs and so we really need to be good stewards and and honor that trust that they've given us so I don't think you have a good sense of that when you enter the business but 38 years later uh, you, you get a pretty good sense that that's what we're here for and uh, it's not for, you know, can I be, you know, does every investment turn out great or can I look like a hero within my firm or, or whatnot? It, it's really about serving your clients to the best of, of your abilities in a business with a high error rate. And so um, it, it's a challenging business, a great business. And, and those are some of my learnings uh, over time, I think. I think that, I think your, your, your comments around the clients are probably really, hit home for our, our financial advisors who are listening, because I think they are often the ones who, they are the ones seeing the clients. And I think sometimes they get a perception from the asset manager that they're sitting in an ivory tower and they're not too concerned about the clients. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really, really good, really, really important point, that one. Um, okay, cool. Um, just one thing I do want to chat about is also is, is COVID-19, we've mentioned it, um, and the vaccination programs. Again, in the, in the webinar that I watched uh, yesterday, one of the things I came across was that is it what makes investing quite difficult globally at the moment is the different pace of the vaccination programs and, and the different kind of economies coming out of COVID. So obviously the US is moving, moving quite, quite, quick, quite quickly. Uh, Israel's done quite nicely. UK is also moving quickly. But then there's, there's some serious challenges in kind of the rest of Europe, uh, definitely in Africa. Um, and what, how, like, what kind of, how does that impact kind of how you, again, the investment world and, and, and do you, I mean, what is your time frame? I think, to, to kind of the world getting kind of back to normality and we're all in a, in a similar place post COVID. Yeah, um, yeah great topic, uh, interesting question. Uh, we certainly just for humanity's sake, cope as quickly as possible and that everybody has access to a vaccine, I think. The encouraging part of this is the solution has been discovered unless there's some setback around a variant or some other problem, but um, we would have fairly high confidence level that the existing vaccines and other treatments are going to do the job to at least control this uh, disease, if, if not eventually herd, herd immunity or other things to make it a 
sideshow at worst. Um, but exactly when that happens, I think the math would suggest the U.S. Um, could be uh, fully vaccinated to the extent anybody wants a vaccine is going to have one by mid-year. So that would be, along with some of the other countries you mentioned at the front end of the curve, we certainly uh, think that the manufacturing capability for the proven vaccines is such that, you know, again, a good, good part of the uh, developed world could be uh, have access to vaccines within, you know, a fairly short time frame, six to 12 months after that. Um, and many have access to that already. And it's other issues maybe that are leading to a slower progression. Um, in a, many emerging markets, I wouldn't say all the necessities around the existing two-shot vaccine require extreme temperature control and other things that I think people know. So there the, the hope needs to be that uh, these one-shot vaccines with less stringent requirements around them uh, really are proven safe and effective. And uh, I think the science that suggests they basically are, but clearly both AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson have had some uh, challenges here recently. And so I think the answer in terms of length of time might, might switch to can vaccines get to the broader 7 billion people around the world uh, uh, based on the manufacturing capability and the proven efficacy and safety of, of those one shot uh, types of vaccines. And, and there again, we'd be hopeful. We haven't seen anything that's insurmountable around Astra or Johnson and Johnson. So count us among the hopeful without a perfect crystal ball. But if you give us a year or two, we would think there's a high likelihood that most of the world would have a pretty good solution to this. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, there's more questions coming through. Um, so from Andrew, um, and actually we, and I also had a question earlier. Um, we asked this question from Lee first, then I'll get to Andrew, Andrew's question. So you've mentioned the emerging markets and I, we chatted about SA earlier before, before the webinar. Uh, and if you invest in any specific SA stocks, and this kind of probably relates to that. Dodging, Dodging Cox used to be large holders of African companies such as NASPES and MTN. Do you still, still hold SA businesses from a global lens? Are there any SA businesses interesting, uh, interesting to uh, Dodge and Cox from a valuation perspective? Yeah, so um, our emerging market interest has been uh, extensive from the very beginning, again, of what we call our international fund, which goes back 2001, and then our global fund in 2008. And so the basis behind that belief is a lot of very interesting, successful companies operating in regions around the world that probably are growing faster in general, in some cases, certainly uh, than many of the developed markets. So combination of franchise plus growth opportunities, either due to the geography or the type of business they're in. Um, but our experience has been to flow to, you know, where we really see all that at a reasonable to sometimes a depressed price. And so many of our investments in emerging markets aren't exactly where you expect them. You'd say, well, China and India are huge and fast growing and this and that. So that must be where your investments are. Certainly we've had select emerging market investments over time in those two countries, but frankly, more of our emerging market uh, investments have been in places like Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, Turkey, Korea, um, and, it's really ends up to be select individual investments that interests, interests us more than everything in South Africa is wonderful or awful. And in the case of South Africa, there certainly are a handful of companies which are in our universe and we seriously consider and we do currently have investments in South Africa, but given the size and, and the number of companies that are large enough for us to really invest in, it's always just gonna be uh, a handful of companies at most uh, in South Africa. As far as our assessment of the country, we think it's a great country in a lot of respects with the usual you know, balance sheet of certain opportunities to either continue to succeed or to improve in certain ways. And then certainly um, other challenges that um, some of which are specific to South Africa and its history and its nature. But I think we've always uh, felt the franchises, the companies we've seriously researched are uh, many are, are world class in terms of the people and the businesses and the franchise. And uh, we seriously 
consider those investments in our portfolio, but against all other investments. So that's the way that one comes out. Currently in the global fund, I think about 13% of the global fund is invested in emerging markets as we define it. And that's consistent with one of the two indexes, which that fund is measured against. Uh, in the recent past, it's been a higher weighting than, um, than the market index in, in collectively emerging markets. But again, I wouldn't read that as a either endorsement or condemnation of emerging markets. We think it's much more fragmented and individualistic than all emerging market investments are either good or bad at any point in time. So, you, so what you basically say, that I understand it correctly, is, is you look at kind of, you look at the, the companies and if the company is, if the, all the odds are stacked for that company, be it they're in an emerging market or developed market, um, then, then they'll, 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 you, you'll, you'll, you'll buy into that company. You won't just go and say, okay, let's go and look at emerging markets. We feel emerging markets are really nasty at the moment. Yeah, and there could be some common denominators, uh, global economy stinks. I mean, it's not a surprise yeah. when emerging markets are the tail at the end of the whip and either economies are roaring, emerging markets might be doing unusually well or vice versa. So there could be some global situations that lead us to think that emerging markets are in, in general are more or less interesting at any point in time, but ultimately it comes down to the individual fundamentals versus the valuation and, and our alternatives. And right now, I think our portfolio suggests there's sort of a normal number of emerging market companies that look uh, quite interesting, but not unusually high or unusually low at this point. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so just, so to ask Andrew's question as well, and it might be a and maybe you've answered it, or it might be a tough one to, for you to answer. So what Andrew's saying is that SA managers are talking up value, and I think we it's, we must talk we must talk value, um, and and, um, and 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 lots of media to jump into this kind of the, into the JSC, so the Joe's but Joburg Stock Exchange. Do you invest into stocks on the Joburg Stock Exchange? Uh, as you mentioned, the core question would be: be uh, Would you invest in SA Inc? Or, or, or are our SA managers telling us the story? So the way, I, the way I, what I'm hearing from you is you're, you don't necessarily go and look at SA. You look at, you look at the companies um, versus an, a South African manager. He will have a very holistic view on, on South Africa because they are based in, in SA. And yes, they're looking for opportunities uh, elsewhere, but they're going to naturally have a bias to, to SA. Uh, so it's probably a hard one for, for you to answer, I'd say. Yeah, we, we don't. We wouldn't have a bucket of investments in any country, yeah. South Africa or otherwise. It would be we're invested in company A, B and C within. They happen to be headquartered in South Africa yeah. or Turkey or Brazil yeah. or, or any other place. But we, we don't go into the bucket approach at all. That's yeah. individual company analysis and decision. I think what Andrew's worried about is, is he's worried is, are, are the SAS managers selling him a story? Um, and I don't think, I don't think you, you, you could, you could answer that one. Um, it does get to the kind of the question, the question I, and I mentioned right at the beginning about kind of your value investing kind of bias. So we have seen kind of the growth, growth stocks do quite nicely over the last little while. Um, but I think your Dodge and Cox's view now is that actually the odds are very much stacked to value investing. Um, can, we, can we delve into that a little bit? Yeah, well, that's been at the core of this market fulcrum around the world or fissure around the world between growth and value. Not all markets are set up this way. The last market in my 38 years that resembled this at all was the tech bubble building in the late 1990s, followed by the tech bubble bursting. I wouldn't say the market environment that we in are exactly twin brothers to the one 20 years ago, but they're cousins. There's a lot of similarities, particularly a sector of the market that's extremely highly valued. In both cases, it's technology. Um, a little bit different there. And then I think there was more flimsy merchandise 20 years ago, uh, the famous pets.com or something that had some astronomical valuation without any real business. You don't see that much of that, but you see a lot of companies with uh, valuation metrics that are at or in some cases even exceed what you saw 20 years ago. So that would be similar. Um, you know, certainly many of these companies have great franchises, a lot of growth opportunities. It's just a matter of how much you pay for them. And we felt for some time that in most cases, it's 
uh, unreasonable level of valuations and expectations. Um, so the growth area did do quite well, particularly early 17 through fall of 20. And, you know, the dominance of technology and the, and the growth, particularly in the United States institutions around the acronym FANG and Microsoft and a few others, uh, the low interest rate environment fed that. And then COVID, you know, was the exclamation point, which happened to advantage technology companies because of the stay at home environment or otherwise uh, relative to many other types of companies. So that's how that happened. But it set you up for something totally different because the valuation gaps became enormous between the growth sector and the value sector, again, akin to the valuation gaps that we saw 20 years ago. So that in and of itself was setting you up for something different. And the catalyst on the fundamental side, again, in a big picture sense, we thought was vaccines leading to economic recovery, leading to higher interest rates and oil prices. And this is exactly what's happened in the last six months. So the last six months value has just hammered um, growth to the point where it's made up and then some for the damage done the first nine months of uh, 2020, not fully the damage done by growth winning the last three and a half years prior to that, but a lot of that. So where do we go from here um, would be the question. We would argue there's really three foundational pieces for why growth could continue to do quite well relative, or why value could continue to do quite well relative to growth. Those would be the valuation gap, while well, it's narrowed the last six months, it's still quite wide. Uh, and you particularly see that because of the technology sector and other parts of the market are still extremely highly valued. So that's where the valuation gap occurs. Some of the bottom has come up, uh, which would be the second foundational piece of our argument that the bottom finance, energy, industrials, travel, uh, leisure, entertainment, uh, uh, all those types of industries select uh, technology companies, particularly hardware that might be more dependent on an office environment. That entire group which has led the market the last six months could continue to rise to the, just a really hot economy in some cases helped by higher interest rates. Um, so that would be the second part of the argument. And the third part of the argument is what really has not happened yet is that top of the market led by technology faltering. Really the big change in between growth and value in 20 years ago was the top of the market crashing, the tech bubble burst. This may not be a burst or a crash, but there's certainly plenty of room for uh, declines and significant disappointments relative to the expectations built into the tech area. It could happen just because valuations are too high. Uh, one money manager was quoted on TV as saying, he doesn't remember any catalyst 20 years ago. Somebody blew the whistle and said, your day's up technology, but it happened and just one day <laughs> things started to fall and they accelerated. It could happen because of a change in the macroeconomic environment. We talked about the impact of interest rates on the growth sector. So if interest rates continue to go up, we would expect some damage in the top end of the market. Going back to work in some sort of hybrid model would be advantageous to certain industries, but probably not technology as a whole. And then technology companies, particularly the big fang group and otherwise, have more challenges than we think is generally appreciated. Those are increased competition, potential market saturation. There's only so many eyeballs or uh, advertising dollars out there to be had would be, you know, the basis behind why there could be market saturation, increased competition, technological change, which often they're disruptive companies that could be disrupted by others legal regulatory threats, which we read about all the time. So long story short, high valuations with potential for things not turning out either quite as well as people generally think, or even taking a U-turn and, and some real significant challenges, problems coming their way could lead to a problem for that top end of the market. So all that together, we would argue would be foundational pieces why we think the value sub portion of the market could still be quite uh, rewarding relative to the growth. Now, having said all that, not all markets all the time are going to be this value versus growth dynamic. Our own portfolio certainly has a lot of value sectors in it, including significant overweights in finance and energy and lower valuation technology. But we're also overweight in healthcare, which would be an example of a uh, industry that's not particularly COVID sensitive, but we, we think has excellent opportunities, particularly in the 
pharmaceutical area, we're overweight in media, which is another area that's, you know, has not been particularly disadvantaged by recent trends, but which we think has a number of interesting franchises. So it's not all, Johnny, one note that it's either value or growth or either beneficiaries or victims of COVID, but we think the valuation structure of this market really leads investors to need to choose uh, one camp or the other uh, as a primary sort of portion of your portfolio. And, and we as value investors have no problem at all knowing in this market where, where to be, and that's in the lower valuation parts of it, and avoiding the many of the high expectation areas. So that may be more than you wanted to hear, but we've, we've thought about that question a little bit and uh, certainly yeah, want to impart our, our, our thinking about it. That's, it's, it's, it's obviously a, a, key, a key point for Dodge and Cox because of a, you say you're, you're almost your valuation bias. Um, I mean, so just to, one thing you mentioned was so was the regulatory or legislative environment that, that tech companies are facing. I mean, they've been put in front of, I think it's Congress quite, quite, quite a bit recently. And that's all on the privacy stuff, if, I, if, if, if I'm right to say, and, and, and kind of the, the data, data share, sharing stuff. I mean, that's going to be a big risk for, for tech companies when they really are in, the, in kind of the, the government's kind of lens and, and, and look, looking at them very, very closely. Yeah, it's a number of different issues. You've identified one real important one around privacy, the use of data, but it's a lot of antitrust uh, towards sorts of behavior. Um, so it's, it's a number of things. It's taxation levels. So I think when you become highly successful and big and visible, you're going to attract the attention of a lot of folks, including the courts and the public policy folks. So it's probably unavoidable, but there's, there's likely to be some damage to monetary or otherwise to the franchises of some of these big tech companies coming out of them. Yeah. Um, we've actually come to the end, Brian. Uh, I've read, um, if there any more questions, please send them through. Um, just have a look here. No, nothing, nothing of late. Um, but yeah, I think otherwise that's, that's it from our side. I mean, first of all, Brian, I think, thank you very much. I think it is now now Tuesday um, on, on, on your, on, in, in California. So really do appreciate your time. And, uh, and, and I think it's been a really interesting and, and great, great chat. Um, so thanks very much. If there are any questions from the audience that, um, that, that, that haven't been answered, please um, send them through to, to, to myself or the N8 BDMs. And then we will share them with, uh, with James, who, who is the, who's, who's in, in, in London, who's I think is the kind of our, our, our go-to person. And I'm sure he can, he can ask, ask it. Um, just to close, let me make sure I check my notes, make sure I get everything. Um, so, so I said thanks to Brian. Uh, CPD process, as I, as I, as I mentioned, um, we will we'll send you a thank you mailer with, the C, with CPD points on it, and also has the video recording uh, to, to go with it. Um, Thank you all to, to the audience for joining. We, we know it's, a, it's an hour of your valuable time and we really, really do, do appreciate that. Um, and, I, and again, I think any, any, any criticism or compliment or constructive feedback, please feel free to sh share with uh, myself and the BDNs. We really would like to make these, these webinars as interactive um, and keep improving them as, as we go. Um, and then lastly, we've got two webinars coming up uh, in the month of May. First of all, we have our second estate planning webinar uh, hosted by Arifa. Uh, that is on the 18th of May. Um, and then I've got a in the room uh, with Lorium Capital, uh, which is on the 25th of, of May. Um, otherwise, that's, that's it from us. Um, thanks very much. And Brian, good man, really do appreciate it. Thank you. Found it very interesting. Thanks, Steve, to you and your uh, team for your organization preparation, and again to the audience for uh, for uh, participating and uh, having a good discussion and all your questions. So, thank you very much. Enjoyed it thoroughly.